Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamualaikum, shalom, machaba, mori mori wanji, namaste, jumbo. Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted and so very honored that you join us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app. On Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find your podcast. Join us right now from the beautiful state of Virginia. Our guest is here today to celebrate a, a true story. It's called Pat a Pillow. Please welcome to the show Valerie James Abbott. Hey, Valerie, how are you? Hi, I'm great. I'm really excited to have you on. This is. Pat a Pillow tells the true story of your family. Am I right about that? It does. It does. It is. It is a version of our true story. Yes. So, tell us a little, a little bit about it, please. So, Pat a Pillow is based on the true story of how our family ultimately came to discover that our youngest child had lost her hearing mysteriously. And how we came to terms with that new reality, and it's narrated through um, a snarky older sister who is noticing things well before the parents do, and is, you know, has a first first row seat for all that took place in those early early days. You know, I think um, there's so much I want to talk about, but I think first I want to address. This this whole idea of something so profound getting by a parent, and and I'm not saying that judgmentally, because uh, while we we thankfully we never experienced either of our kids losing their hearing or uh, having s- something so potentially catastrophic happen to them, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with our kids, and because we're with them every single day and most of every single day and things change so so slowly and incrementally that there's a lot of things that 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 are able to slip by us just because we are so busy and because the changes happen so slowly correct correct and it wasn't judgmental what you said because it's true you know when when Children lose their hearing, especially those that have hearing loss that is acquired after birth. And that goes by many different terms, late onset, acquired, delayed, postnatal. It's got a lot of different terms, but we're basically talking about hearing loss that happens after the newborn period. It's really subtle, but significant at the same time. And it depends on when the hearing loss begins. So in our case, we never really knew, um, or ever knew for sure when it started. We know that it was probably during toddlerhood between 18 and probably 20 months of age, maybe, but it is subtle. And so a child that is developing normally, they're babbling and they're talking and they're singing and they're dancing and they're doing all these things in a language we don't understand for a while. And then eventually over time, and each child is different, that that unique language that is their child's changes into what we know as whether it's oral English or whatever the language is of the home. Well, what happens with a child with hearing loss is they will say what they hear. And for her, since some of the language she had acquired was accurate during the very, very early part of her life, some of the sounds were correct, but some of them were distorted. And so it was this bizarre language that she had invented and that we had come to understand. And that's what Patapilla was, you know, one of the millions of words that she was using that um, seemed cute at the time, but in reality, it was a symptom of a much bigger issue. Yeah. And, and, you know, I am sure that if I were in your shoes at that time, I would have missed it completely because it's like, 
you know, my my especially my son grew up and we ha- it bilingually, and so half of his words were English, half of his words were Spanish, half uh, another percentage of his words were a mixture of both. And he would use the different languages in sentences. And it was cute. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, uh, I, I, I'm sure the same. I w- would have been hearing these d- different words and thought the same as you. Oh, it's cute. And I probably would have picked up the words and started using them myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. And so with children who are being raised in a bilingual environment, um, this kind of mixture... <laughs> of languages is very developmentally normal, Mm -hmm. right? And so they are, they're kind of taking part English, part whatever other language they're learning and and trying to figure out how to do that. In our case, we didn't have that. We were really just um, an English speaking family, but you can see just how difficult it can be to notice what is sitting right in front of you. Uh, Granted, there were some other behaviors and those are outlined in the story that that were common signs, but that we didn't notice. Things like when someone would knock at the door. You know, most kids would freak out and be like, oh, you know, who's at the door? Um, She didn't really respond. When the phone would ring, she didn't get excited the way most kids would get excited. And those were just things we we just didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And But if you add all of those things together in retrospect, she had many of the common signs and symptoms. Right, right. But, and... You didn't go to parenting school to to receive a list of here are the things that you should be looking for to make sure that your child's hearing is developing normally. And the other thing, when when our kids are at that age, not only is their hearing developing, but their 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 sight is developing, their speech is developing, they're walking and they're talking, they're interacting. So there's all these other things that we're looking for. And again, we we're not given a manual of, you know, it's week six, they should be doing X, Y, and Z. And even if you do get one of those manuals, it's a flyer, you know. Right. Well, yeah. now, you know, so this happened for us 15 years ago, and there's a lot that's changed, but there's a lot that hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. I'm grateful that the CDC um, Learn the Signs Act Early campaign, which is now in every state, um, they do have materials that are, there's even an app that you can put on your phone that families of very young children can kind of track developmentally. Are there are there children doing the things you would expect in certain time frames. We didn't have cell phones the way that we have them now. And we certainly didn't have a super active CDC Learn the Signs Act Early campaign taking place at the time. So there are a lot of things that are available now, and there's a lot more emphasis on the importance of monitoring developmental milestones. But at the same time, parents are parents and families are families. And sometimes we're just trying to survive the day. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, if our kid is gaining weight well and they're growing well and they're eating fine and they're sleeping okay, um, the fact that they might not be talking the way we might expect is not at the highest priority for most of us. Yeah. yeah. So we talked a little bit about, yeah, it, it makes perfect sense that we might miss these different things. And you shared with us some of some of the things that maybe you could have picked up on. Uh, that your daughter was picking up on these things kind of quicker than you. I'm really interested to know what it was like when you finally went to the pediatrician and found out, yeah, uh, your kid, there's, there's, there's a hearing loss here. And what were, what were you thinking? What were the feeling? How, how did you react? Yeah. So, in the United States, it's not the pediatrician generally that's the one that figures out what's going on. <clears throat> and that's because most pediatricians don't have hearing screening equipment, nine out of 10, um, probably more than that. So in our case, it was a preschool teacher that said, you know, after about four months, are you concerned about her speech? And we said no. And she was the one who recommended we reach out to our local early intervention office and ask for a speech evaluation. And that ultimately is what led to the hearing evaluation that led to the diagnosis. And when that happened, I cannot express how overnight my husband and I inherited this backpack that was filled with panic and guilt. 
And every family that experiences an unexpected disability diagnosis goes through some kind of process, some kind of, um, some people call it the grieving process, some people call it um, what's other things. But for us, it was primarily panic and guilt because no one could tell us how it happened, when it happened, why it happened, whether it was going to progress to profound, whether it was connected to some other issue, um, some other syndrome. So we had a lot of questions and not a lot of answers. And then, like you were saying earlier, this guilt of how on earth did we miss this? Did we all miss this? Mm -hmm. And when we eventually did, and it was, you know, she's a very, very healthy kid. So we rarely saw the pediatrician. We went for vaccinations and for well checkups, but she was never sick. And so when we went in for her third birthday, a couple of weeks before she'd gotten her hearing aid. So he wasn't even part of the process mm. in our case. And when we show up and he goes to look in her ears and he sees these pink hearing aids with silver sparkles in the mold, he's like, what is this? He said, they're hearing aids. And he said, when did this happen? And we said, a couple weeks ago. And I remember him opening up her file and flipping to see if she had passed her newborn hearing screen in the hospital. And she had. And he said, but she passed. And I said, that's right. She passed. Mm -hmm. And that's over the last several years, I've learned that, you know, the prevalence of pediatric hearing loss doubles between birth and school age. So just wow. as many children who are identified as deaf or hard of hearing at birth, you take that number and you multiply it by two. And just as many children lose their hearing between birth and school age as those that we identify at birth, yet we generally don't screen children between birth and school age. We don't screen them again until kindergarten or first grade. So in terms of early language and literacy, it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. Finding these children sooner is a big, big deal. So we wrote this really as a testament to just how subtle but significant hearing loss can happen and all of the things, all the you know, all of the, the technology choices and getting to understand what hearing aids are capable of and that it's not always a rosy story when you first put them on and you have a lot of questions, you have a lot of worries, um, both from a parent perspective, but also as a sibling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. So talk a little bit about your, your other daughter's experience as a sibling of, you know, whose who, who si sister has this profound challenge in, in their life. Yeah. So she was um, she was five at the time that all of this was going on, five or six. And so she doesn't really have a ton of memories about it. And so when I was writing the book, I really had to think through if she could remember, what would her memories have been? And so that's when it's, you know, is it a true story? It is a version of the true story because I don't know. And, you know, we never really had the conversation when she was very small for me to say, what do you remember? Um, but what I do know is that all of us, it, it, it was part of our family journey. It didn't just impact the child with the diagnosis. It didn't just impact the parents and the child. It included an impact on the sibling. And that's something that we often forget for any family of a child with a disability, if there are siblings around, there are siblings around. And so it's expect, it's imp impacting them too. And they're going to have um, um, an experience as well. Mm -hmm. And it may not be one that they remember, mm -hmm. but it still impacts them. Mm -hmm. So Mary Claire was very, um, very protective of her sister. She, whenever it would rain, this was before hearing aids were water resistant. So we had to be very mindful of when there'd be a pouring down rain or near pools or near sprinklers or near any real major thing of water, certainly at the beach, those kinds of things. Um, she was very, very protective of her sister and would, you know, grab, grab a bag and like put it over her head and um, make sure she always was walking out with an umbrella. And uh, the other thing I noticed was that when Mary Claire would come across other children who use technology to hear, whether those were hearing aids or cochlear implants or Bajas, um, that she knew enough to say, hey, that's a cool color on your implant. I like it. Or if there was a sticker, because lots of them have stickers on them, you know, what is that, Mickey Mouse? Have you been to Disney? You know, to kind of acknowledge this technology and that it's cool. 
And that's one of the ways that it impacted her was knowing it's perfectly acceptable to admire and acknowledge and inquire when with te- about technology on children and to take their lead from there. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to inquire. We've talked uh, a, a number of times about cochlear implants here on the podcast. Uh, I think most people are familiar with hearing aids. You use an expression that I'm not uh, not familiar with at all. Bajas. What what's a baja? Yeah, what's a baja? So a baja is a bone anchored hearing aid. So not all children can be fitted with um, a hearing aid that that hangs off of the back of the ear, and um, and so there's a, a different type of hearing aid that works in a different way, and we call them bajas, and um, they they. They just work differently. Um, uh, I'm not an expert in, on Bajas, but when you sometimes will see children with uh, microsia and atresia, so their part of their ear is not fully formed, you'll notice that they're wearing something different. And um, for some of those children, what they're wearing is a Baja. Ah, fascinating. This really is fascinating. And one of the things that you're kind of demonstrating is that while a lot of parents, these th- whether it's a hearing loss or the, the child is, is on the spectrum and we don't notice it right away or wh- whatever it might be, that while those that might get biased initially, once a parent finds out that their child has a, a challenge in their life, the parent goes out and becomes the biggest, most fierce advocate for their child, and they become uh, somewhat of an expert in in that field and, and how best, to, certainly you become an expert on how best to advocate and to help your child, but also advocate and help for, for other kids who experience the same kind of thing. And that's certainly what I'm seeing and hearing from you today. Yes. You know, the, the early on, it was all about just her, just Bridie. And in the story, we call her Bridget. Bridie is the Irish nickname for Bridget. Um, and so that's what we call her at home. But, you know, in the very beginning, your your only concern is on what do we need to do so that our child can thrive? And while on the inside, some of us, and I will raise my hand to this, is you have this, this feeling of, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know how to do this. And that's a very painful thing to be carrying around for a while. And then when you have some successes and when you advocate and it works and you advocate and it fails, but you learn from that and you do it differently next time and then you succeed is you become a stronger advocate by just jumping in and doing it. None of us, none of us were prepared to raise a child with a disability of some kind, regardless of what that is. And and so I would say most of us feel very unprepared. Mm -hmm. Even parents who have, who come from early childhood education or special education, once they have their own child and they're facing it from a parent's perspective, it's daunting. Mm-hmm. But there comes a time for some of us where when our child is thriving and we're, we've kind of figured a couple of things out where we realize we can't, we must pay it forward. We must share what we know on behalf of other families, on behalf of other children. And having seen how difficult it was to turn her language and literacy skills around for her to be kindergarten ready, we cannot afford for children who acquire their hearing loss later to be at a disadvantage from those with congenital hearing loss simply because we haven't figured out a good way to find them yet. Mm -hmm. And so I speak on behalf of the children who are unfound, the ones who acquired their hearing loss after birth and who are still missing. We need to find them before kindergarten. We need to find them as soon as we can. Absolutely. One of the things I wanted to ask you, I don't know, I, 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 before becoming a a full-time magician traveling around the country, I worked in human services, and my last human service job was working with kids with severe developmental disabilities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the parents shared with me is they didn't get a lot of help from the traditional medical community. In fact, they felt kind of shunned. It was almost as if 
these doctors who had been very helpful and very caring, once it was determined, we really can't fix this problem, I don't want to see you anymore. Did you experience any of, of that? We did not, and I think that's in part because the only issue that we were facing was hearing loss. Mm -hmm. Gallaudet University estimates that 40% of children who are deaf and hard of hearing have other conditions in addition to hearing loss. And that's a large, that's a lot of children. And so when you have a child that, um, and in some places we call that deaf plus, so you have your deaf or hard of hearing plus some other condition or situation, um, it can get very complicated very fast. Mm -hmm. And not all pediatricians are developmental pediatricians. Mm -hmm. um, not all audiologists are pedi pediatric audiologists. Not all ENTs are pediatric ENTs. And so um, it, what you're describing is, um, I think, improving. Certainly over the last 15 years, I've, I think we've seen an increase in understanding and uh, an effort to improve services for children with disabilities, including severe developmental disability. Um, but I think part of that is a, is, a, is a shift, not just in the medical community, but in, in the community as a whole in our nation, is we're becoming more understanding, more accepting, more embracing of children of all walks of life, of all situations, mainstreaming them. They are part of they are part of our world and we are part of theirs. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that was my job at that school was to help mainstream them, mainstream kids into different um, typical community activities. And uh, it was it was ch I was gonna say it was challenging and it was a challenging job. Not because of the kids that I was working with or because of the typical kids. It was challenging for all the adults who said it couldn't work. Many of them at the school <laughs> I was working at. Yes, and that's remember where we come from. Right. You know, I remember, you know, what's interesting is in Patapillo on the last page, or the second to last page, where um, Bridget is being reintroduced to the classroom, her sister's holding her hand, and her, her older sister's very worried about what are the kids going to say. And in that illustration, you have a preschool classroom of children um, that are representative. One is in a wheelchair, one is using a wheelchair, and the other um, the other child more or less represents um, children with other invisible disabilities, for example, autism or ADD. And the um, and the boy says, you know, what are those? And which is a very normal question for any child to ask. And when my I showed my mother originally that uh, preliminary illustration. Her response was, do you think it looks too much like a special, you know, a special education, you know, classroom setting? And rem and remembering where she's coming from, where there was a time, including in my lifetime in the 1970s, where we didn't have children with disabilities in our classrooms. Mm -hmm. They were in separate classrooms and in some cases, separate schools. Mm -hmm. So there's still that, that um, remaining memory of the way that we worked with children with disabilities and it's very very different now and so the t the tide is turning mm -hmm. it's slow but i do think that the younger generation of um, educators they don't they see a very different uh, version of education than those that are our age and older yeah uh, you mentioned Gallaudet University, which is an amazing place, and I had a chance to visit it. My wife's um, goddaughter was a student there, and we went to visit her, and the thing that surprised me more than anything else, it was the single loudest place that I had ever visited in my entire life. Yes, there's a lot going on. <laughs> There's a lot going on. When I was um, uh, when I was a college student, a friend of mine had graduated and went to Gallaudet to get her master's degree, and she asked if I would come and spend the weekend with her on campus at her dorm. And you're right, it was very loud, but it was um, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, first experience that I had being surrounded by the deaf community and and not being deaf and not using American Sign Language and um, the rules of etiquette were very different than what I expected and. Um, I think they are doing amazing things at that school, um, both in the undergraduate and graduate level. And um, we should be really proud in, in the United States to have that 
that college as well renowned as it is. Absolutely. Hey, I know that people are going to want to know where they can go to find out more about Patapillo. I think it's really important. I think it's a, a wonderful book that a family should have in their family library just to start the conversation about kids with different abilities and how we can become friends with those kids. I think, I think it absolutely belongs in, in every classroom or at least every school library. So where can people go to find out more about it? So um, my website is ValerieJamesAbbott.com, and you can find some information there. It, both Patapillo and the Spanish edition, Patapillo, <laughs> um, are both available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and those, um, and those places. But I'm really thrilled that it was republished um, a year ago. Yes, just shy of a year ago um, in Spanish because the, you know, children of Hispanic descent are at increased risk of uh, pediatric hearing loss. And that's not something that's talked about widely. So we were very eager to have this published in Spanish as well. And just be, is there a reason why kids, uh, Hispanic kids are more at risk than others? So I am not a medical professional or an audiologist. And I do know that there are different theories for why that is the case. Okay. Um, and so there's there's lots of answers there. That could be a separate podcast. But um, the data is clear. Children of Hispanic descent have an increased incidence of hearing loss versus any other um, group in the United States. Well, I, perhaps we'll have you back on to have that conversation. Yes. We've had a great time speaking to the author of Patapillo. Our guest has been Valerie James Abbott. Valerie, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you. This has been fun. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. And we hope that you'll join us for the next exciting episode of the show. To make sure you don't miss a moment of the show, please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. Big thanks going out to my team, Fana McCann, Rory Brady, Jordan Saley, Will Cheever, Cassandra Masonet, Stephanie Davila. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast. 